Hello, welcome to tutorial 23, where we're building a Minecraft-like thing using Python. And in order to do so, we're not using Unity, <laughs> we're using the Asina engine, which was coded by Petter Amland and some other contributors. Um, open source-wise, I need like some kind of mouse mat. That's making a horrible noise for you listening. Let's try this old dinosaur book. That's pretty good. Okay, so this video is all about uh, sorting out our trees. And what we want to do is, I just turned off the sound just in case that annoys, annoys you. Um, <clears throat> we want to give our trees new textures. We want to sort out this. If I try to mine the trees, then what's happening is that we are spawning walls because, or underground soil because that's the mechanism that does the following. If I'm mining in the ground, then to give the illusion that we're mining in lots of layers, um, we spawn the layers as we go as we go down, as you'll know from the, the earliest videos in this series. Um, okay, just looking over here because again, I'm watching, or not watching a game, but I've got the score. Canada versus Belgium. Belgium should um, be the dominant team, but Canada, I've had a penalty, probably should have had another penalty, and should have scored. Um, it's nil-nil at the moment, coming up for half-time. And here's a panda. So, um, oh yes, last video, what did we accomplish? We accomplished something to do with the, um, the inventory, uh, such as, I hit number one, so I've got uh, the soil blocks here highlighted. So now if I'm building, we deplete, and... There we go, we're out of blocks. Now if I try to build another one, I can't. But if I then go and mine something so that it fills that highlighted um, inventory hotspot, I now build and I can build. So that's a mechanism that we did last time. So trees, etc. Let's have a look at my list. Okay, one little job to refactor RARA, random module class. So during last video, I very, because I was against the clock, I very quickly hacked a solution to a module class. So basically what was happening, I think, in Mesh Terrain, we newly imported the inventory system, which imports the random module, which I was already um, importing here. And confusingly, there's a function called random from the random module. And so some things were getting cr um, clashed. And then what I did was just re-import random as rara, and then there were three places here um, in in um, the mesh terrain module where I was replacing a call to the random function, and I was just writing rara. But in the future, when we look to that code, it would just say rara, and I have no idea what it, what it means. We'd have to come up here and kind of do some investigating. So instead of that, I've just now. Um, commented out all that nonsense <laughs> with Rara and I've just said and I've put in a new comment random module comes with inventory system as Ra so in the inventory system what we're doing there is importing random as Ra which means because we've imported everything in the mesh terrain module from the inventory system it means we've got that RA reference to random um, so if I do command um, F to find um, random in here, I'll go and find those three places. So here, instead of just having random or rara brackets, I've now put, um, or parentheses, I've now put ra dot random. So we know that that's probably the random module, easier to understand than rara, um, and we've got a call to the random function. So that's in generate block, just in case you're making this similar change or you wanted to know. All my code is on the git is on is in the GitHub uh, repository. Link is in the description in case you want it. In case something's going wrong with yours, maybe you just want to copy and paste a bit of my code. That's fine. Or just get everything. So that's the first randomy bit. Where's the next one? Oh, it's all, oh, it's just a little bit further down in the same function. 
So there again, we've got RA dot random, and it's probably yet a bit further down again. So the three places where we're using random are all in the same function in the generate block. I don't think it's happening anywhere else. So all I've done now is write RA to refer to the module and then dot random to call that random function. And then everything works, <laughs> which it was doing before, but now we haven't got this rah rah import, which made no sense. So number one on our list done. Which means we can get to trees for our trees. Trees mineable. Okay. So let's go and have have a look at mesh terrain. Which oh, goal. Belgium have scored. We're now into uh, one minute after extra time in uh, half time score. They uh, Belgium have scored. Was it Kenneth, uh, Kevin De Bruyne? No. Batshuayi. I don't know who that is, but why? 44 minutes. Brilliant. Brilliant. You know, watching most of the game, and then I switch it off, and then everyone scores. I miss Japan, scored two goals today against Germany, of all people. Well done, Japan, by the way. Um, beat Germany 2-1 uh, earlier on today. Um, what am I looking for? Oh, yeah, so we're in, in mesh terrain, and here we go. We've got a function called do mining. And what happens in this tiny little function we create a new variable called epi for like epicenter. Where is the center of the place that we're mining? And then we call a function mine and we pass in the terrain dictionary, the vertices dictionary, the subsets, text atlas, and the subject. And that mine function returns um, a, a tuple, I believe, in the mining system. I presume it's in the mining system. There we go, mine. And at the bottom there, yes, it returns the build tool entity's position and uh, the first, oh, it's the, the subset that we're mining from. And it does all the mining in there, <laughs> including spawning a collectible. So if I go back into mesh terrain, what we then do is say, well, if that variable doesn't equal none, i.e. we've returned something, i.e. we've done some mining, then we generate walls, I generate those brown soil blocks um, at th that position and on that subset of the terrain. So it's like we're adding to the terrain subsets. Then we um, refer to that subset and regenerate the model so that we can actually see the, the um, spawned walls. Now, we don't want to do this if we're mining a tree. So we want to say something like um, the something like if the epicenter doesn't equal none and um, the block type that we're mining doesn't equal uh, wood. Um, have we got wood on the on the tree system. Where's our tree system? Uh, not the tree system, it will probably be in, um, oh yes, sorry, it's in the same module. It's gonna be in mesh terrain. Um, plant tree. Oh, we're just planting concrete and ice <laughs> at the moment. So we definitely need um, to say here, wood. There we go. Um, in the back of my head, I'm kind of thinking, well, wouldn't it be nice if we could make our trees out of anything and we don't spawn a load of walls on them? So we could have, we could have an extra piece of data added to our block types or our, it makes more sense to, you know, like we've done gaps, like gap blocks, like air blocks to kind of prevent walls from being generated and things like that. Um, we could do something similar. Anyway, 
no obvious solution is bubbling up. So let's stick to the plan A. So at the so for the trunk of our tree we want wood. And I guess oh, if we did want like concrete wood, then we could have you know, we could create our own um you know, we could create our own system of um, block types very easily by just saying wood, concrete, and, and so and so on. Anyway, we'll call that wood, and then top of the tree we'll call foliage. There we go. So we need to go and create those as our next step. Although, maybe I'll just go and finish what I was writing in here. So now when we plant a tree, the block type is going to be wood and foliage. And so there we go. Just scrolling down a little bit to do mining, we can now say, and the block type doesn't equal wood and uh, block type, but I think I can just put this in brackets and then I'm allowed to go onto new um, new lines, is that right? And um, block type doesn't equal, um, Um, foliage. Then we can generate walls. Now we've got one problem. Block type doesn't exist. But what we could do, because I, I can't get hold of the block type here, um, we don't know what the block type is going to be. Um, oh, unless, do we have it from um, the BTE? Is the BTE in here? Uh, this sub camera. BTE, there it is. But no, the BTE doesn't have a block type, I don't think. So what we're going to do is um, in our mining system, we're also going to return, so at the very bottom of the mine function, we're going to return the block type. Here we go, block type equals the block at this position that we're mining. So we can return block type. There we go. So now we have access to that crucial piece of data. If we go back to the mesh terrain um, function, no, nope, module, we're in the do mining function. Now I can say um, epi, and I want to get the, not the first, the second, but the third. Um, variable returned. So that's going to be index 2 because we start at index 0. Index 0, index 1, index 2. And just so you know what I'm talking about, epi is the variable that, or the tuple, that will um, hold, store the variables or the, the values that are returned, I should say, from the mine function. Again, if I go back to the mine function, here we are, we're returning one two, three values. The third one is the block type. So that's what we want to, to access. So that's why I'm saying index two, because that's the third index along. Zero is first, one is second, and two is third. So we're saying, so epi2 is the block type. Um, epi2, there we go. Um, doesn't equal, yeah, so epi2 doesn't equal word and epi2 doesn't equal foliage. Then go ahead and generate some walls, do some digging. Um, otherwise, it's just going to mine that tree, either the trunk or the foliage. Now, I was just about to test this, but we can't because we haven't got a wood type and we haven't got a foliage type. So for that, I need to open I need to open the uh, config file. 
there he is. So I always love doing this, um, adding new minerals in here. So how do you do it? Well, but you can kind of see a pattern. You put a string for the name, which is fun, of your new mineral type, and then um, a colon, and then you've got a tuple of at least two coordinates on our texture atlas. So that's what it's doing. It's pointing to the textures in our texture atlas. Um, I'm just going to switch off my Wi-Fi. There we go, because um, that was distracting me. It was trying to find the Wi-Fi, which I can't find in this room. Um, okay, so, right, we need our texture atlas up probably soon. Anyway, to add a new one, I need to add a comma. So I'm um, adding to this, this dictionary list. And I can now say wood. And let's have a look at the terrain um, atlas. So I've got this texture atlas. Um, there we are. I think you can see most of that. I'm in GIMP. I don't know if I could just shrink it so you can see the entire program. So the entire window. There you go. Um, if you haven't seen this in an earlier video, GIMP is a free online open source uh, photoshopping piece of software, and it's really good. All right. I've already added on a wood texture. There we go. So this, again, this um, texture atlas 3, I'm calling it, or texture underscore atlas underscore 3 dot PNG. PNG so that we can have transparencies. Um, I put this in the assets folder. Um, for example, here we are in our Python Meshcraft tutorial. I started this in 2021. Um, so here are all our modules and in the assets folder, it's where we keep all the sounds and all the 3D objects. There's our panda model, um, snowflakes, and the texture atlas here. Probably the most important asset um, because it holds all the textures for our landscape. So I've opened that up in GIMP. You can open it up in any photoshopping software you want. And the way it works is we've got um, five 12 pixels across the wide and then five pixels for the height of our texture. And then we've got um, one, two, three, four, as it were, four blocks, four by four of uh, 64 pixels in total, meaning each side of our cube is going to be 16 pixels along, which is handy to know. For example, in GIMP, I can go to the menu, which isn't on your video, sorry, at the top, there's a menu, and I can just go to view, and then I can go down to um, um, <laughs> Maybe it's in tools. I'm trying to look for create new um, guidelines. Oh, there we go. So it's in the image. It's in the image menu. I go down to guides and then I can say new guide. There we go. Um, direction. That's not what I'm looking for. I'm not looking for guidelines. Cancel that. I was just looking for grids, wasn't I? Um, but where is the, where is the menu for sorting out how big your grids are? Anyway, I've just put show grids on, but notice this is quite nice because it doesn't line up with what I've got here. Let's just uh, zoom in a little bit. I'm kind of zooming in, sorry, onto the wood. There we go. Okay, so we want all of this to line up so that if you're like drawing and changing things, you can see what's going on. Um, image guides, no, configure grid. So it is an image, but not in guides. Go down to configure grid. There we go. And now I can say the horizontal ones want to be 16 by 16 pixels. And if I press enter, because those are tied together, they will. Um, they will, sorry, the, the vertical grids will copy 16 pixels from the horizontal. There we go. And now <laughs> it's all lined up nicely so you can see exactly where your, your surfaces start and end. Right, so if you're making your own textures, 
using grid lines would be important. In fact, should we try and make some um, some foliage? So the first thing I'm going to do is actually zoom out, and then I'm going to copy and paste uh, what I've got already. So I've gone to the selection tool. Oh, and then you want to put on, is that in tools? Um, colors, image. Oh, no, it'll probably be in selection. No, not in there. Oh, there you go. It's in view, apparently. You want to have snap to grid. Because now, when I'm selecting things, it will snap to the closest grid line. So that I can easily select from here to there. There we go. So I don't have to like eyeball it and mistakenly do it. So now I want to copy that. So I go to edit, copy. And now I want to select nothing. And I'm going to zoom out again. Now I'm going to try control V. There we go. <laughs> And then make sure I place it in the correct position. Remembering it's four by four, so I don't want to go there. Because that would be only, I was going to point to my screen, you can't see. It's only three down. So there it's four down. And again, it's snapping to grid, so it's going to be exactly aligned. And then I can go to the selection menu and select. Oh, I can't select none. That's weird. Oh, I can't select none because now I've got a floating selection pasted layer. All I have to do is flatten the image to take that off. Flatten image, there we go. No, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I've, just, I've just made my, uh, my transparency disappear. Can I do Command Z? Oh, thank God. I just want to kind of anchor this layer. How do I do that? Uh, anchor layer? There we go. <laughs> okay. Professional level image software, photoshopping software, is fiddly, as you've just seen. Um, so in case you're using GIMP, um, that will be helpful. I've noticed when things are going wrong, it's because you've selected things. I've still got things selected. where, And then you're trying to like paste something or trying a, to add a filter or a tool or something. And it's not working, it's because it is working, but it's only working in the place you've got selected. So keep your eye on what you've selected, keep going to select none um, to make sure you haven't got anything selected. And then where I was having a problem, i.e., trying to deselect things, I wasn't able to because there was like a, a, a floating layer waiting to be um, kind of crushed flattened into the final image and to do that all I did was right click on the layer the floating layer and I went down to anchor layer so anchors it in the in the lower layer there we go <laughs> so all we're doing there is copying these uh, these textures but including the transparency that's really important and now I get well I don't really want <laughs> I don't really want them there actually I want to turn them green so let's see if I can select these guys. And remember, oh, I want to go four across. Oh, no, I don't, because the actual texture is only three by three. Um, because we've got um, eight sides of a die, eight sides of a cube. No, it's six. It's six. Six sides of a cube. One, two, three, four, five, six, eight. Right. Um, what am I going to do? Can I just set that to transparent? Let's do that. Um, what if I just press delete or backspace? No. Um, there should be, I know from memory, <laughs> there's going to be a way to, to just say delete to transparency, fill with foreground. Oh, what about clear? There we go. That worked. <laughs> clear. I must have pressed the wrong delete. Um, now, in this area, I just want to create maybe some noise or something that's kind of green. So first, let's just go and get some green from the color palette. 
There we go, just in case we need that. And then remember, I've got this area selected. That's where I want to add my wood to. And I'm doing it kind of, sorry, add my foliage to. I'm, I'm making it aligned with wood so that when we come to fill in the UV coordinates on our config file, it'll make our life a bit easier. Kind of wood and foliage will go together. So I've got that area selected. I'm going to go to tools and then see if I can find anything interesting. No, colors, image, layer, filters. That's what I'm looking for. <laughs> Why didn't I just prepare um, <laughs> what I'm doing here so I knew what I'm doing? Um, um, OK, noise. Right. Let's just try some HSV noise. Let's try that first. Hue saturation, I can't remember what V stands for. And hopefully it's going to give me a preview. Oh, it is, good. So hue, well, satu saturation, we're getting nothing. What's our hue? Nothing. Value? Well, nothing's happening in there. This is awful. not because I've got a weird seed. Just go to OK. No, nothing happening. Now it's either because I've got some strange thing happening because I've selected this area in the wrong way. Well, let's just try just filling in that in green. OK, so that so stuff is working. Um, well, let's now try to filter um, and go to noise. Just try HSV noise. Oh, it's possibly because, oh, the, okay. <laughs> the noise filter is being applied to what's already in that selected area. So if I'm applying it to transparency, then all I can generate from that is transparency. I was kind of anticipating, I was, add, I was introducing some new color, um, which I wasn't. Right, I don't want to change the hue saturation quite nice um value ooh that's pretty cool for tree um but what i would love is to be able to add some random areas of transparency um no i don't so i'm not skillful clearly i'm not skillful enough to know how to select random areas but maybe that I know what I could do. There's probably a brush, like the pencil tool. How big is that? Oh, I do know if I do. No, I can't remember on a Mac, but if I go to view, I can center image in window or center selection in window. That's what I want to do. Zoom, zoom to selection. There we go. Zoom to selection. That's pretty good. Very useful if you are fiddling around with 16 by 16 areas and pixels. So then what do I want to do is, um, yeah, go to my brush here. And I want to, ah, so I can see kind of, that's the kind of area I want. It's three by three pixels, if you can't quite see that. And I kind of want a brush that deletes. So mode normal, dissolve. That's probably what I want. Dissolve, um, I'm just seeing if there's like a, an obvious setting within this tool to dissolve to um, transparency. Well, there isn't. I'm just making these like. holes which is kind of awful I think I don't know <laughs> can I undo all of those oh and command Y to redo thank goodness okay so I don't know right <laughs> so I don't know what tool to use. 
Um, let's just use selection then. Can I select within this? So if I just select in there, and then just... I don't seem to have a delete function. Um, let's go to select. Oh, what was it? It was it was in selection. Invert. Is it an image? Um, transform. No. Colors. Oh, there's probably right. Oh, color to alpha. So the alpha channel would be transparency. Let's just have a look. Oh, yeah, that's gone more transparent. Look at that. Transparency threshold. Brilliant. That's exactly what I want. So it'd be nice to have kind of like a random selection that I'm dealing with. So let's try select none and then let's use the feather tool or or fuzzy selection tool and then basically if you've got the draw mask on you've got feathery edges um, you can then like pick a spot and then kind of drag down and it will select things of a similar color no no it isn't I want to use this tool throw next to it let's just go to edit select none sorry if I go to, what's it called, select by color tool, again, you want the draw mask on, threshold, I don't know, fairly low, anti-aliasing on, feather edge, and then do the same. There we go. And now if you drag down, you can select more and more colors that are similar. So about there, so I've selected a, a load of areas. And now what I can do is go to select. Where did I find clear before? Oh, there it is. It's in the edit menu. And if I just go to clear, I kind of want it semi-transparent, don't I? So that was in colors, color to alpha. And then all I do is raise the transparency. Okay, so I've got a little semi-transparency going on. And then go to OK, and then edit, select, uh, none. OK, so that will be our, <laughs> our tree texture. So now I can do um, minus, minus, minus to kind of come out again. So there's our tree area. <laughs> oh, yeah, obviously I didn't need all of those squares, but I've done a few of them. OK. I don't know how transparent that's going to look, but that's the beauty of this. You can go and improve this. Right, so now I need to save this file. Um, no, I don't. In GIMP, you have to export it if you want to save it as a different file type to um, GIMP's inbuilt XCF file type. So you want to go to File Export and then make sure I'm in the right place. Yes, I'm in my tutorial folder and it's called the same thing, texture atlas three or texture underscore atlas underscore three dot PNG. That's what I want to export it to. And then export, and then it's saying I've already got one. Do I want to replace that file? I do. Um, then I've got some extra settings, which I don't understand. So I'll just leave those, export, done. Okay, then we minimize this and now it's the, uh, exciting thing. Uh-oh. GIMP is trying to run something. Let's just force quit that. Hopefully it doesn't destroy everything else. Okay. So, we've got wood. Where is that on our texture atlas? Thank goodness. It was just a script that kind of uh, crashed, not GIMP itself. So um, let's see where soil is opposed to grass, and then we'll get a, a feeling for things. 
um, so soil is at 10, 7, whereas grass was on 8, 7. So it looks like the second number is our x dimension. Um, does that make sense? No, because they were on the same y. <laughs> so the second one is the, the y. OK, so 7 is that row. So is the next row 8? Let's have a look. Um, I can't remember what's on the next row. So on the next row is snow and concrete. So snow and concrete. Um, I have six. Ah, so the top row is seven, then it's six. Okay. Uh, for Y, and then grass is at eight. Um, and what are we comparing that to? Um, soil is nine, ten. So it's going along that way. Okay. So that's going to be, let me just. So, yes, so to summarize what we have on our texture atlas in terms of UVs, the X starts at 8, this is 9, 10, and 11. So, let's go and fill that in <laughs> while, while I remember it. Um, there we go. Uh, 11 for X, and then the Y. The first row starts at 7, then it's 6. So our wood is going to be 7, because it's the same as grass and soil and the ice. Um, next entry, we'll put in our foliage. And no comma for the last entry in our dictionary. So again, the x is going to be 11, but it's the next row down, so it's going to be 6. There we go. So now we're pointing to the correct place on our texture atlas in um, in mesh terrain. When we say the block type, is it this? Is it wood? Is it really right? Should things be working? Let's go to main and uh, run. There we go. I'm tempted to make. Oh my god, our Oh, our trees. And yeah, we can kind of see through them. Very nice. <laughs> They're way too tall to, to properly ex uh, inspect. Oh, here comes a panda. Oh, look, you can kind of watch him, watch him coming. Um, oh, look. Our foliage is one too high. There's a, an off by one error. Let's go and sort that before I forget to do so. So in our plant tree function in our mesh terrain module, presumably in here. Uh, so I just scroll up a little bit to plant a tree. There in the crown, I'm generating the block. So it's this Y. So that needs to be Y minus one. And it's probably because I'm starting at TT. So TT would start at zero, but it wants to be at minus one. Anyway, shall I just minus one here? Save that. And then let's just see if that squares things up. Presumably, I didn't notice that before because um, the trees were too high. There we go, I'm able to mine them. Oh, the crucial thing is, yes, we can now mine trees. That's the, uh, the thing we're actually testing. Oh my goodness, the panda just, <laughs> just dropped on our head. Um, oh. Oh, oh, uh oh. I've made our entire world transparent. So, <laughs> when I was selecting all the similar colours uh, before, 
I was also selecting the grass. Oh my god. I wonder if that's affected anything else. Like, some of the snow will be a bit green. I'll tell you what, you won't have to watch me struggling to sort that out. I'll either pause and sort it out on GIMP or when I upload the assets for this video, i.e. the, the, the improved um, terrain atlas, I will <laughs> I will um, sort out the, the grass, <laughs> which is now transparent. Although, this gives me an opportunity to talk about um, what if we're mining? It's nice to not instantly mine, but in our game we might want to, you know, have to work at our blocks with our pickaxe or our hands. And what we could do to simulate this panda, honest, honestly, very naughty, um, to simulate cracks, we could just wrap the current block that we're mining with um, just a, a very simple cube. Um, with um, transparency except for some crack lines and then we could have I don't know seven of those crack line textures which are mostly transparent and you just iterate up through those different textures so that would simulate them um, more or less breaking oh my goodness look in fact the whole block is uh, the mini thing is um, transparent. Oh dear. Right. I think I kind of got away with it. Not too much of the um, the other textures have been affected. Oh, that's hilarious. Right. I'm pretty pleased with the how the trees are looking though. Um, right, let's make them shorter. Um, which brings us to the Perlin distribution actually because those things are connected before I think at the start of I think at the start of the the previous video tutorial 22 I was talking about how the strength of the Perlin value for our trees also determines or I'm using to determine that the height of the tree as well so Perlin and the height of the trees are linked but anyway, are the trees now mineable? Yes, they are. Done. Um, yeah. Uh, tree textures. Done. I'll just say um, grass transparency. <laughs> the smiley face. Kind of a bug. Not really a bug in the code. It was a bug in my non-existent um, photoshopping skills. I say non-existent. I kind of got the stuff done, didn't I? I made a kind of okay grass texture, um, which I'm sure it'd take you guys about three minutes to do. It took me about 10 minutes. Um, tree Perlin distribution. Right. So let's go to our tree system. At the moment, it's nice and small and hopefully will stay this way. But this class um, called the tree system um, we've got a static me uh, method which means we're only we're not calling lots of instances of it we're just calling this one instance this one system and we're giving our tree um, Perlin object 32 octaves um, its seed is 2022 the tree system frequency that's kind of the smoothness of the distribution of where trees might be is 64 and then um, we're using those values in generate a tree, um, which uses the current um, block position when we're light, laying down terrain, and it returns us a number. If that number, which I'm storing in ent, is greater than 1.435, then I'm growing a tree. We don't want a magic number here. We just want to say if ent is greater than 1, then return ent. Also, we need an amplitude really to do that. So we're going to say um, amp for amplitude. Where's the frequency? Tree system frequency. Oh, there. Oh, right. So actually, sorry. <laughs> we need tree system dot amp equals 10. Um, 
which I just know from memory and I'm remembering from my prepare code if I go into the tree system I'm going to have octaves 8 and frequency 256 okay octaves 8 frequency 256 and balancing those values out as long as we multiply ent so times equals um, tree system dot um, amplitude we will get nice clumps of trees let's go and have a look at that oh before we do just go back to mesh terrain because we were determining the size of our tree here so trunky one key ent times 10 um, so and we're using that magic number kind of twice so let's create a new um, a new variable so tree height or just tree h will equal three let's just say and then uh, that can be an integer can't it that will, will that be an in, will that be taken taken as an integer I'll just cast it there so we explicitly are telling ourselves because we're going to use that in a, a range um, we, it needs to be an integer, not a floating point, not a real number. So we can say um, tree height there. Whoops. And I can go down to, now we're talking about the crown. So the Y position depends on how high the tree is to start building the, the canopy, the crown of the tree. And so we just need to replace that by tree height. Oh, <laughs> it wants to be, sorry, integer. Oh, so we do need the casting. It's going to be three times whatever ent is, because <laughs> that's going to be returned, isn't it? Okay, so now let's go and run. Presumably, I'm going to have these either unbelievably tall trees or very short trees, but lots of them clumped together. And we need to deal with that issue. Right, they're going to be very clumped together. Did you see how long that took to load? So I'm going to press G stop generating stuff there we go and I've been foisted on top of the canopy which is kind of interesting so I'm now walking around on transparent and semi-transparent leaves which looks pretty cool can I oh no so the whole world or well, that whole part <laughs> is trees Okay, so we've got too many trees everywhere, and I thought, why don't we just use um, kind of prime numbers and say if our tree happens to be on a prime number place, then or potential tree, if our potential tree is going to be planted on a prime number or multiple of prime number, then or a compound number, I should say, then you're not allowed there. So. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the following. Go back to the tree system. Check whether to generate a tree here. So I'm in generate tree, and I'll say if um, our x position modulo um, three, then return zero. Remember, return zero means no tree here. And then we can copy and paste this for the Z. And then we can copy and paste those. And just pick other numbers where you don't want trees. So I'm going to say, I'm just going to go through a few prime numbers. Um, I also want to, actually. There we go. I think that's what I've done in my prepare code. Let's just have a look. Tree system. Yeah, I've done two, three, and five. So I haven't done seven. That's interesting. Have I done anything else different? Amplitude 10, random int for my... I am using a random seed for my... Um, for 
my seed <laughs> for my tree seeds. There we go. <laughs> also, it is a really tall tree. Interestingly, it's just it's on its own. Oh, here comes a panda. It's gonna land on the tree. <laughs> and then fall out of the tree. How interesting. Oh, so presumably this is zero 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 zero. Um Where are all the trees? The mystery is I'm sure I've now just copied my prepare code, where I've got a much nicer distribution. And originally, I was in my prepare code using the C2022. So it can't be that. Or maybe it's because I was... Um, Taking out multiples of seven. Or I was talking as I was coding and didn't pay attention to what I was actually writing. Yeah, okay, so <laughs> so I was saying a load of nonsense. If x modulo three equals zero, so that means it's an there's no remainder, that's what that means. So modulo means divide this number by 3, but don't return how many times it divides. We want what the remainder is of doing that division. And so if there's no remainders, it means that 3 goes exactly into that first value. Okay, <laughs> so that's how we get exact multiples. Whoops, I just uh, zoomed in, which is a bit scary. Right, control, uh, what am I doing? Control V, fading to paste. Oh, I've just got that tingly spidey sense. There might be another goal. What if it's Canada? That's the thing. Someone just texted me. No, it was an email, a work email. Nope, still 1 0. 77 minutes. You haven't got long, Canada. Um, okay, so it's still different from my um, prepare code in a good way. I, I haven't just mistyped anything, but I have included multiples of seven. And now I'm trying to run my game from the tree module instead of going down to main and then running from there. Let's have a swig of tea. Let's have some tea. Mm. Let's get out of here in case a panda falls on me. Oh, this is brilliant. So, we've now got the effect of being in that panda is coming for me, <laughs> hunting me. It's like predator hunting me from uh, the trees. Um, we've now got the sense of there being trees distributed around, um, not all clumped together. What I'm not happy with is you can kind of tell that they're in a predictable grid <laughs> and I'm sure there's a nicer way to sort this out probably using a trigonometric function like sine or cosine to kind of wiggle where they are and that's quite a nice um, problem challenge to go and solve come up with your own algorithm within that generate tree function to decide whether to put a tree down or to to kind of adjust where it should be grown. So it's like this one maybe one across, this one leave where it is, this one two across, something like that. And the challenge is to do it in a predictable way so that next time you run this exact seed, you get those trees put in the right place. It would be easy to do it with randomness. You just say randomly bump it this way or that way. But that would be lazy and you wouldn't get exactly the same world. That's great. Um, we're also not getting that much of a variety with 
their heights. So again, it would be nice to have some trigonometry involved to kind of like wave them around. We could add another noise object to kind of wiggle them around because they don't want to wiggle too much, i.e. differentiate too much because trees grow in the same environment, will have the same conditions, so they will be of similar size. Um, I'm also thinking the actual tree design, we could get some branches coming out. Um, that could kind of be related to the nth number, I guess. Um, how have we got too many trees? I'm not generating land, and I've just walked off. That did seem to be more trees than in my prepare code. Anyway, I'm kind of happy with that. Maybe in the tree system, let's play around with a few things. Um, Oh, one one plus. That's probably legacy from the old way of my thinking. So I've just saved that and rerunning. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so I was basically <laughs> forcing trees to grow everywhere. And then only just kind of like taking out those... Um, uh, factors, those multiple areas. So this is more of the, yeah, this is more recognizable for my prepare code. And this is kind of nice, we're getting like shrub-like trees here. Oh, this is nice. I'm in like a maze. Yeah, shorter trees over here. Oh, it's like a little, uh, a little uh, grotto, like a grotto. Very nice. I am noticing interacting with trees and things now that. Oh, look at that! See, at the top of the hill, you've got a load of trees, um, and that won't be a coincidence. That's because we're using the same seed. We're using twenty twenty two for both my tree purlin noise and my landscape so if you do want some interaction between height <laughs> literal height and uh, where trees are being distributed then knowing to use the same seed can can help uh, but you don't have to do it via that you could just say if we're at a certain height then there's like a stronger um, possibility of having trees again all of these kind of like values and things, it's like playing around with a, a lovely mechanism by which you're growing worlds and biomes. It's really fun to play with and develop your own systems. Hopefully I'm giving you enough of an idea of how the code works so you can go and experiment yourselves. But this is definitely what I'm gonna do, so I will show you. But yeah, this is, I think this is about the balance of trees that you want. You want areas where there are hardly any trees and then just these little clumps of trees but not where they're all growing together and by using those uh, multiples to remove trees oh dear i just glitched through the train I haven't done that for a while it's probably because i was trying to grow terrain and um tree was very large, although I'm not growing any terrain now. Or was I? Anyway. <laughs> it's probably the gods saying, stop playing with the game and go and do some more coding, which we'll do. Okay, pearl in tree distribution, done. This is not bad. So we're mining trees now, we've got new tree textures, of sh and we've got foliage texture. Um, oh, the field of view. So, in main, let's do this. Um, let's do this. Actually, 
under camera dash. So that's the rate at which the field of view changes when running. So to have the dash or the sprinting um, effect, we're doing that via field of view. So it makes sense to do this here. But we can actually say window, what is it camera? Yeah, it's camera, FOV, stands for field of view. And we can set that to, for example, 70, which I think feels about right, but apparently, Minecraft is set to 63. I remember I read that ages ago, so I don't know how correct it is. If you know better, do leave that in the comments. I'll be particularly interested if Java and the Bedrock editions, i.e. the C++ editions, have different uh, fields of view. That would be like kind of nice behind-the-scenes kind of information. Anyway, we set that to 63. Now, We've got to then go and look at our dash um, mechanism because that has to spring back to the original field of view, um, which has now been changed. And I think before I put it to 90 or something like that. Oh, there we go. So running and dash effect. So when we're holding shift and W, i.e. running forward, um, if the camera's field of view is less than 100, then we're, we're adding <laughs> the, the dash effect. So it, it won't go beyond 100. Else, so if, we've, we're not hold, if we're not running, then we want to decrement the field of view until it hits 90, but we don't want 90, we want the original value. So we'll call this a rig field of view. Let's see. A rig field of view. So everywhere I'm seeing 90, I'm putting an original field of view. And then let's just make sure that we're in the update function. So I'll make sure that we've got global access to a rig field of view. <laughs> I don't know why I say it like that every single time. Um, and we need to go and make that variable up here. So we want to say camera equals 63 equals. Can I do this? A rig field of view equals. Does that work? So I'm saying field of view equals original field of view, which equals 63. I think I can. So let's go and have a look at what that field of view looks like. Oh, my first thought just then was, oh, this is going to mess up the UI, but it hasn't. Press G to turn off. Uh, um, generated train so we've got a nice smooth frame rate. Does this look more like Minecraft? Yeah we do get very close it looks like we get really close to our blocks. The blocks look a lot larger. Well I kind of like this. Yeah kind of I feel more immersed. And I still haven't got full screen so I could get set it to full screen and it might be even better. Okay. Oh and can we dash? Yeah, and the dashing effect still still works. Oh, I'm missing clouds. We definitely need to do day-night cycles soon. Okay, let's go back to main. Go to our to-do list. We've just hit an hour. Um, oh, look at that trees and rocks. Well, I've done trees. This is for these were the notes for eighteen. Rocks would be nice. I know we could just do areas of stone. Oh yeah, I should prepare that. That's what I'll work on, like these massive areas of like mountains and stones. That would be really good. Because in my prepare code, actually, when I was making the tree system and experimenting with different Perlin noise values and heights of trees, I was accidentally creating these giant trees and they looked awesome, especially when they're all clumped together. They look like a kind of wooden mountain or something. So, uh, yeah, I very much recommend you experimenting with that kind of thing. Right, field of view to 63. That's done. And we corrected uh, for dash effect. Yeah, we introduced the orig. FOV. Um, location coordinates as text on screen. 
and in the future making a little mini map which Minecraft doesn't have it would be nice if our version had a mini map so you know knew where you are approximately on the on the map and that might lead to other mechanisms um, I'd love to get this audio thing sorted out and then I've got refactor things oh I just had an idea I was gonna add it wasn't I um, I said giant rocks Part eight, um, giant giant rock areas, like outcrops. Um, no, I can't remember what I was thinking. It was some kind of future idea. Um, let's just get our location on the screen. Um, we'll do that in inventory system. I was almost going to add that to main. So in our inventory system, maybe every time we move. So that would be only when we've like pressed a key. So my idea is I'm scrolling down to the very bottom where we have an input function, I think. Yeah, inventory input. So I think this gets called from main every time we, we press a key. So at the start, let's just write some commentary. Um, since we may have moved update on um, location text. Right, let's just make some location text. Um, where am I? So Y will stand for uh, where am I? Where am I equals a new text object. And first of all, we'll just say nowhere. Um, and we'll say scale equals, that's going to be a tuple, I think. No, it's not a tuple. Just try 1.4. Oh, and remember, you can put in uh, chevrons, kind of the color that you want. So I'll start with black and we'll start with bold. So it kind of stands out as much as possible. And you can add a background, but I haven't had much look, uh, luck with that. So I'll, uh... oh, and this will put it in the center of the screen. So we kind of want to go um, origin equals minus 0 0.5, comma, zero. No, we also want to go minus 0 0.5. That will probably make it go down when I want it to go up. So let's just do the opposite of my instinct and then <laughs> that might be right. Oh God, UI coordinates again. Um, okay, so then um, we can say, yeah, we'll just say y dot text. So y is the text object, but it's message, like it's string, is dot text like property equals um, I was going to use an f string. Can I use an f string here? I have no idea. How do I do f strings? Do I just write f? Um... <laughs> I don't know how to use f strings. That's so embarrassing. Do I just use f outside of the string and then do, or is it only for print that you can use f strings? I don't know. We'll find out. Um, and I'm going to say, so um, I want this subject dot um, x comma, have a little space, and then the subject dot z. Um, and in fact, I want to floor those. So I don't want a load of floating point garbage trash on the end of it all 
practice if my F string works. Oh, oh, since I set it to black and bold, will that? Well, just in case. Let's add that there. Right. <laughs> Let's run that, and then the F string <laughs> won't work. <laughs> Oh wow, we've got nowhere. Oh, but we haven't pressed the input key yet. Ah. Oh my god, guys. Oh, at least it didn't... At least something didn't work. It um, completely uh, put it out the middle of the screen. Oh, because origin, sorry, is kind of like the alignment of your text, what I want is probably position. But now you can at least see your X and Z, which is nice. Um, it'd be kind of nicer if I um, um, used X and Z. Oh, so you can use F strings. So that's how to use F strings. <laughs> you put F in front of your string, and then if you want to concatenate in, i.e. insert any variables in, you just use curly brackets and then you can do any kind of like code stuff inside the curly brackets and the F string will do all the magic for you. The gluing together and concatenating. Um, anywho, so we want the origin to be left alone. Maybe say position <laughs> is minus 5.5. I'm guessing that's all I need because a text object will be a UI object. Um, the scale was a little small, wasn't it? Let's say 2.4. And then also, oh yeah, I was going to say um, X. And then uh, Z. Or shall I say like east? East that and north that. Talking of north and east, etc., you can come up with a little, or will come up with a little mechanism whereby, am I going north now? Yeah, there we go. East. That is right. Oh my god, I got my north and my east. Spontaneously correct. <laughs> there we go. So now I can see where you are. And also, I kind of placed it in the right place, so I need to go back a little bit. Left. Oh, accidentally pressed E. Switch on off terrain for a second. Now I can kind of go exploring and finding interesting places, and you can record <laughs> where they are. And maybe it will be nicer. Hello, Panda. It might be nicer to, when we press E, to kind of then toggle on that text. And toggle it off again. So it feels like you're kind of like consulting a map or getting your equipment out. That might be nice. Um, also, another U UI thing. Look at the hotbar. I haven't spaced out the hotspots correctly. Um, so that's something to add to the to-do list. Let's just go and move that text left a little bit. So I've said its position is minus 0.5, so it's maybe minus 1. But the Y position was spot on. Let's have a look at that straight away. Oh, I don't know how the game ended. 1-0 Belgium. Oh, unlucky Canada. They were playing amazingly. I didn't see or listen to the second half, so I don't know how well Canada did in the second half. Um, then again, Belgium didn't score anymore, so they've done okay. Um, right, um, so one was way too much. I knew this was too easy to, uh, to get right first time, so minus 0.8. And that will be fine. 
that'll do. Or maybe it has to be 0.75. I bet it's 0.75. Oh, it's going to be times the aspect ratio or something. Although 0.8, look at that. That's dead on. That must be to do with the aspect ratio of our window. So maybe I need to uh, refactor that later. Right. Good. And it'd be nice to get the background on the text as well. So what was I just saying to add to our to-do list? Def ah, before I forget. Um, number nine is uh, text background. E.g. for um, location text. Um, oh yes, the the um, UI hotspot um, spacing. It's not too nice. I wonder if we can try that now. So I'll say I'll go to eighty minutes. What's that? One hour twenty minutes. That's about that's about fine for a video, isn't it? Um, since we're using brackets here, I'm just going to put that on a new line so we can see what's going on with our text. Where am I text? Um, what am I doing? Oh yes, so when we're spacing the hotspots out, which we do do. the close to the end of this module the inventory system module hotspots for the main inventory panel and then just above that hotspots for the hotbar and down here where we're yeah the exposition of our hotspot which I'm temporarily calling bud we're using these uh, this equation so because we're iterating over how many we're fitting along about nine isn't it We're having to do things relative to the hotbar's x position minus the hotbar scale times 0.5. Ah, so that's half the length of the hot bar over there. Well, I guess for you guys, this way, <laughs> opposite to what I'm thinking. So that puts us at the very left. And then hots plus hotspot scalar, again, it's only half of it, plus some padding. Where's our padding? Oh, there. Padding. <laughs> right there. Padding. So that's just going to be the uh, hot bar scale minus um, what is that? I don't know, just like a little bit. Right. Basically, if I make this number smaller. Or this, or this number bigger, like 1.2, something might happen. <laughs> that spaces them out. And the only problem is if I get it wonky. Okay, that wasn't good. Okay. Retreat. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's getting at exactly at the left hand side. So it's this one. Uh, plus scalar. Uh, so if I do that by 1.2, uh, that should shrink the gap between and no extend the gap. Now we're getting a bigger gap, right? Let's make smaller padding. Oh my god, I could just copy and paste my prepare code. 
where I got it right. No, that's awful. So that number has to be 0 0.5, so because that's creating the symmetry. Oh, but I could do the buddy scale, so I could do in here, I could say 0 0.5. Seven. That that should squeeze them closer to the edges evenly. No, that just <laughs> that just did terrible things as well. Hmm. Hmm. Let's take out the padding. Plus hot star fan point five times one point two. Because that in my mind just spaces each one out a little bit, including the first one. So that should give us a bit of padding. Yeah, but it now needs to be, um, a bit larger than that. No, because then, mm, oh. If I did that times 1.2, then that makes it even across, no, no, <laughs> or yes, <laughs> no, that's too much, ah, but now I'm getting, yeah, this is the, this is the idea, And so that might relate to padding, whereas, it, yeah, if I did that there, now it just might be, um, yeah, so I'm getting even spacing, but I can't have that much space. This is interesting. It should be like one. I should be able to... Oh no, I've gone over one hour, 20 minutes, and I'm not ach achieving anything this last little bit. Oh, because I'm just fiddling around. Oh, look, <laughs> that's really close. We just need to shift them all to the right. Oh, <laughs> so how do I do that? Uh, plus, <laughs> if I did here, times 1.1. No, 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 because that's minus plus uh, times 1.1. 1 .1. Yeah, no. <laughs> that won't be right either. You know what? That's so close, isn't it? This is awful what I'm doing. I, I'm, I'm not understanding. Well, I'm, I've got a horrible mixture of understanding a little bit what's going on and uh, not knowing really what strings I'm pulling at. <laughs> and somehow I've got the exact answer I want. But there we go. Now I've made the inventory gorgeously aligned notice that it's not aligned here on the main inventory panel but presumably i can just go and copy that so what did i do i took out the padding nonsense and then on the second line multiply by 1.2 and then on the third line 1.1 no problem oh i've done padding on the x and the y oh no so let's just take out padding on the x 
um, and then just say yeah take out the padding multiply u by 1.2 and u by 1.1 then change that to 1.2 because I mix them up and u to 1.1 and then just go and have a look at that um, I should be talking about next video now next video <laughs> Don't fiddle around with any inventory. Um, that's one thing. Yeah. That's kind of made me... Th okay. <laughs> so I was just guessing on the bottom one, wasn't I? If that's not worked, it should be generalizable. Generalizable? To um, any uh, distribution of these guys. Unless I just mixed around the 1.2. 1.2 at the top. 1.1 at the bottom. Ah! <gasps> I just mixed them up, so maybe again. A lovely combination of knowing what I'm doing and not knowing what I'm doing. So let's just gamble and do that for the Y position as well. Um, yeah. And then remember to comment out the padding. Oh my god, it fits. It's definitely off, isn't it? By a bit. So it isn't... It isn't um, really the solution we're after. I think the the issue of it being slightly off will get worse. Oh, I'm now inside of a tree. Now I'm on a tree. <laughs> so the bump system... Oh, that's what I was going to say earlier. The bump system, I need to revisit. I didn't do very good videos on the bump system. I kind of just showed the code without creating it from scratch like I'm doing with things, um, which isn't as good um, for like understanding how it works. So I should definitely revisit the bump system because it's not nice to kind of, as I were, like walk into a tree and then kind of getting stuck like here. Yeah, there, I can't move forward, but I can't see anything. If I wriggle a little bit and move around and stop pressing down on keys, let go, and then move again, then you kind of get out, but it's not a nice experience. It's not correct. You should just be able to slide past things and not and not get stuck. So that needs to be looked at. But, um, yeah, the inventory system. Yeah, if I had, like, a, or if you have a different number of rows... My present way of aligning them will get worse with different numbers, I imagine. So, um, where's my to-do list? Oh, bump system, wasn't it? UI hotspot spacing. Refactor, because it's going to work. It's fine. <laughs> so, in other words, I won't relook at that probably ever again. Uh, <laughs> But I do want to look at, yeah, bump system. Sticking to trees and climbing them without meaning to. Uh, which isn't too much of a problem at the moment, but we do need to look at that. Okay, so next video. Yeah, rocks and things probably. And we're getting closer to December, so I've got to prepare something for Christmas, something nice. Um, okay, thank you very much for watching. Any questions or any suggestions, do leave them either in the comments or on the issues page of the GitHub repository that's linked in the description. Thank you very much, and uh, well done Belgium <laughs> for their win. Goodbye.